Um, this here, uh, if you haven't seen one of these before, is a megaphone. Um, this one is actually my mother's megaphone from when she was a cheerleader in high school um, just a couple years ago. Um, and uh, shout out to my mom. Uh, this is a megaphone, and what the sole purpose of this fiberglass cone is to amplify somebody's voice in order for people to hear it in a far distant place. That's the sole purpose of this item here, okay? Um, over the centuries, uh, this design and shape and tool has been used in many different ways. When it was first invented, um, I think I'm using the word invented kind of loosely because I guarantee sometime in the 5th century there was a guy walking around at the market in Greece and saw a pretty lady walk by that he like wanted to get her attention and like tried to talk to her and tried to yell to her and when nothing else failed he just panicked and went, hey girl! And there in the moment the megaphone was invented, okay? Um, that, the, the point of that story is that guys have not changed in thousands of years. We are still dense and hopeless, and our best efforts at, at pursuing beautiful women at the market is, hey girl. So um, pray for us, please. Um, but over the years, this has evolved into a tool that many different people and many different things have used it, um, whether it is to communicate over a long distance uh, to somebody, whether it was um, commanding troops in a military battle, uh, or used to wake up recruits in the military where they'd, pr they'd play the bugle uh, through this in order to wake people up. Um, lifeguards have used these to tell you to not run at the pool um, or lifeguards at the beach. Uh, cheerleaders, uh, yeah, cheerleaders are uh, obviously a fan of these. I'm sure at some point in your life you've seen a picture online of uh, a black and white photo of a 1920s movie director sitting in his chair with one of these so that he can give his cast and crew some direction without leaving that really cool canvas chair that he has. Um, this thing has had so many different uses over the years, um, and universally, it has become a symbol that when you see one or a picture of one, it is a symbol of something is being and needing to be proclaimed. Um, so it is no accident that that is the symbol that we will use uh, for our time together in Habakkuk. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at a small book uh, in the Old Testament. Habakkuk is a, a, a small book in the Old Testament that is sandwiched right in between uh, Nahum and Zephaniah. That's helpful, right? That helps? No? Okay. People are like, what is Nahum? Is there a book named Nahum? Okay. Yeah, that's, it's right there. It's Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. Uh, for any future people, that's like a back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back hidden gems list of like future baby boy names. Um, so... Uh, keep those in mind. I may have to do uh, that myself. But Habakkuk is found in the prophetic section of our Bible. Um, again, in this book on page four, um, there's kind of a breakdown of how the Bible is organized. Last week um, in our time in Timothy, I had mentioned that the Bible can be broken down into ten different categories, as well as five different parallel categories that kind of make the themes for the Bible. Um, on page five, you can see those themes that we have here. And so what I wanted to do is also give you the resource for how the Bible um, is organized. And if you look at it here, you will find that Habakkuk is found in the minor prophet section of, of the Old Testament. And um, I hope that these two resources are, are helpful for you um, and that they grow uh, in your study and reading of the Word um, it's my absolute hope that the more time we spend together in the Word, um, it will cause you to grow in your love for the Word, and that it will lovingly grow you as you spend time in it. That's, that's the goal um, with everything that we do here at Bridgepoint, is a point to Christ, learn in His Word, and spend time growing in our relationship with Jesus. Habakkuk is considered a minor prophet. Uh, in, in, our, in our Old Testament, and the minor prophets were called minor not because they were unimportant, um, because no book in the Bible is unimportant. Uh, they are called minor prophets because of the, the length uh, and brief nature of their writings and prophecy. 
Uh, now, the word prophecy, we're going to toss that around a couple different times over the next couple weeks. To define prophecy fairly simply for you is prophecy is a message in which a prophet proclaims to an audience uh, that was given directly from God. I know you're not supposed to define a word with the root word of it in the definition, but um, a prophet is a man of God that has been given a word and they proclaim it to a people who need to hear it. So that's what prophecy is. And um, Habakkuk was a prophet. And being a prophet, Habakkuk was called to be a physical megaphone for the word of God. That he was called to proclaim, um, uh, proclaim messages of hope, of warning, and even sometimes of condemnation. Um, many times... Titles of the books in our, in our Bible are given specific titles for a reason. This one's called Habakkuk because every once in a while, they, uh, when they canonized Scripture and translated it into the English language, they put a title on it. And some of our books in the Bible are titled based on who wrote it. So you think about a book like Isaiah or Habakkuk. Sometimes a book is titled based on a... Um, based on a theme that is running throughout the book. Think of Proverbs or the book in the New Testament, the book of Acts, where it kind of lays out the acts of the new church, how the new church became uh, the church that we now know. And some books are also titled based on the first few words in the book. So if you think of Genesis, the first words in the book of Genesis is, in the beginning which is a, a picture of the genesis of time. Or if you go to the end, when we get to Revelation, it talks about how this is the revelation of John. They use the title Revelation to kind of go for that. One, because that's what it's about. And two, because the title John was already taken. Uh, first John, second John, and third John was also taken. So they just, you know, kind of cut that out and called it Revelation. So um, not much outside of his name do we know about Habakkuk. It's kind of an unknown uh, prophet outside of these three chapters. Um, he's talked about a couple different places in Scripture, but this is about what we know of him. And, and his name actually means to embrace or to wrestle, uh, which is unique because those are two things that he does with God in these three chapters. And, and last week we talked about how Habakkuk has been called the prophet with a problem. Uh, and his prophecy is set against the backdrop of the decline and fall of the kingdom of Judah, God's chosen people in Israel. So this is kind of where he is writing from. This kind of gives us a background and a picture of that as we get into it. His book is, is pretty unique as far as a prophecy and a prophetic book is. Um, his book spends a lot of time talking to God about the people rather than talking to the people about God. Uh, as a prophet, their main goal is to listen to what God has said and proclaim it to the people. But Habakkuk's, Habakkuk's book is a little bit different because he talks to God more about the people than he talks to the people about God and what is troubling him spiritually and morally over the rapid deterioration of the nation of, of Judah and the kingdom there. And so the three chapters that we're going to spend time in are written around the dialogue between this man and God. Habakkuk was, a ch was chosen to be a megaphone of God's declared word uh, to the people of God. But as we read through this book, we will notice that as he is a megaphone of, of God's word where a prophet is supposed to broadcast God's message to the people. As we read, we will see that the aim of Habakkuk's words go from outward to upward, and he begins to bring his thoughts and confusion to the Lord in a vertical manner. So if you would, we're going to start here in Habakkuk 1, uh, starting in verse uh, chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to be in verses 1 through 11 this morning. I have uh, two points uh, for us this morning, and we will get into those. So if you would join me in reading Habakkuk 1 through 4. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. 
So the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteousness. So justice goes forth perverted. I've got two points this morning uh, for our notes. And the first point is that Habakkuk was worrying he was worrying. We see that here in these first four chapters. Habakkuk begins this dialogue with God by questioning God's judgment, which is honestly the perfect way to start off a book in which last week we said the theme of Habakkuk is to trust God no matter what. Thanks, Habakkuk, for making it easy on us to make that connection when the first four verses are you complaining. Um, but hang in there and we'll get to the trust portion for sure. We see here in the first four verses, it says, O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you will not save? Habakkuk believes God is letting sin go unpunished. And he's not, he's not happy with this. He has taken a few correct facts about God um, and turned them into some faulty conclusions about God. And and. I think that this is a safe place, and so I, I want to admit that I, I fall into that camp sometimes. Sometimes I take facts about who God is and create faulty thoughts about what God does and how his work is, and it, and it gets me kind of twisted when it comes to the way that I relate with, with God. And, and what I mean is, last week I shared a little bit about my testimony of how I came uh, to know the Lord when I was 15, and I had about as many problems as the average 15-year-old would have before I met Christ. Uh, acne and uh, awkwardness. Okay, those were the, the main problems that I had as a 15-year-old. And, and when I gave my life to Christ, um, Jesus did not take away all my problems. Okay, he didn't. I was, I was still awkward and I still had acne. Um, and honestly, as I grew in my relationship with Christ, I found that more questions came as I, be, as I grew deeper into my relationship with Christ than I had before I was a believer. Um, now, there was a question that Jesus did settle for me, and that was uh, the nature of my relationship with God. That problem was solved. The problem of sin and death in my life was removed, and a relationship with God was replaced with that but as we come to know the Lord, questions such as, why do bad things happen to good people still pop up? Maybe even the question of, why do good things happen to bad people pop up? Sometimes we ask God questions like, God, you call me to pray to you, but I'm finding it difficult to hear an answer from you. Why do you want me to pray if you're not willing to answer? These are not questions that are answered immediately when we become a Christian. There's still questions and things there for God to reveal to us. And the story of Habakkuk is no different. He surveyed Judah and the, the international scene and he saw a problem of sin. He saw a covenant-breaking sin between the people in Judah and Israel and their holy God. And you know what? He did the right thing. When he saw the problem, he brought it to God. He brought his worry to God he shouts to him, why do you make me see iniquity while you idly look at wrong? That's bold. That is bold to say, while I have to sit and look at this, you're off looking at other things while wrong is going on. That's, that's a faulty view of what God is doing in heaven while we are down here trying to hold all the plates that are spinning. He says, destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. He knew the kingdom of Judah was rapidly deteriorating. And in light of that, he began to ask those familiar questions of God of, why are you letting bad things happen to your chosen people? Why are you not hearing me as I cry out to you in prayer? I mean, the Bible says here, he says, how long shall I cry for help? How long shall I cry to you violence? The Hebrew here translates the first cry to a, a cry of help. And the second cry is a shout. So it is elevated from, I'm here asking for help. And he's here, Lord, I, we really need you. Why are you not reaching down and helping your people? And so he continues. So the law that you have set up, the covenant that you have set up, is paralyzed by the sin of these people. And justice goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous. 
So justice goes forth perverted. The nation had a problem with its leaders and how the leaders were interacting with the law. Either the leader of that time was ignoring the law or they were exploiting the law. But either way, they were not worshiping God in the law and that was causing issue and causing problem. And Habakkuk brought the worry that he had to the Lord. Do you see the words that he uses? Like you can feel the distress in his voice with the words that he uses of his worry. He said, you will not hear, you will not save destruction. He uses the word violence, strife, contention. He uses the word paralyzed to talk about God's active covenant with man. He says justice never goes forth. And in a time when God was looking to use Habakkuk as a megaphone to his people, he turns his face upward to complain, to lament, and just to tell God that he was worried. Now, I can respect that. That's something that I can say, okay, I don't think that bringing your complaints to the Lord is a negative thing. I don't think it's bad as long as the motive of your heart is to be understanding and to grow closer to him. Years later, many years later, Paul writes a letter to the church at Philippi. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, if you want to write it down. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. Paul says that the church rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonable this be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It says, let your requests be made known to God. God knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly what you want, and he knows exactly when he is going to do what he's going to do. But he still calls us to let him know that we are in need. Not so that he can give us all of the things that we want, but so that he knows, we understand he is the source of all the things that we need. That when we go to him and say, God, we need this, it's not because we want what we want, it's because he is able to give us what we need. And so we are to call out to him and make our request known to God. And I would say that Habakkuk has done this here in these verses, and he's done this before. The way that he writes, it sounds like he's been doing this over and over and over. And just now he is saying, I'm really going to make this clear, God. I need this to change. And he makes that known to God, and that's what he's doing here. He's letting God know how worried he is about the kingdom of Judah. This is the language that, and what I love about this, is the language that he uses in his worry points to his understanding that God is who he says he is and will do what he says he will do because when he says, will you not hear? That's his way of saying, I know you listen to your people. Will you not save? I know that you have the power to save. He is looking to God for help because he knows that God is there. We should feel the same freedom to bring our worry to God. Just like Habakkuk did. So the first point this morning that we, we've walked through is that Habakkuk was worrying. The second point this morning is that God was working. Now just to pull the curtain back on, on sermon writing and study and presentation, um, we have two points this morning because there are two things happening in our text. If we have three points and there's two things happening, we are missing what God is speaking to us in the Word. So we don't pick the points and apply them to the text. We take the text and allow it to find our points. So it wasn't that we couldn't find more things. It was, as we read this, the text tells me two things, that Habakkuk was worrying and that God was at work. And so as we keep reading here, God responds to Habakkuk in his worry and doubt. He didn't give him an explanation, okay? He didn't give him an explanation of why he was doing what he was doing, but he gave him a revelation. He showed him, this is the picture that I am painting. This is the tapestry that I am weaving. And oftentimes when we go to the Lord and we bring him things like our worry, we are expecting him to answer us. But oftentimes it doesn't work that way. 
Now, there are times, because our God is a gracious God, that when we bring him something, he answers us. Why did this happen in my life, God? There are times when he will answer us. I I don't believe uh, that there are unanswered prayers. And I know that flies in the face of the great prophet Garth Brooks. Um, But I don't believe that there are prayers that are unanswered. I think that there are times when the answer to prayer is moved in a different direction. But I believe that there are, are answers to our prayers and God reveals those to us. Sometimes out of his grace, he does answer our prayers. Sometimes out of his grace, he unfolds for us a picture of his plan and says, this is kind of what I'm doing here, hang in there. And other times, he gives us a revelation of, listen, if you just hang in there with me, I'm in control. And he gives us a picture of his sovereignty, and he gives us a picture of, of how we can trust in him. And I love it because in Habakkuk's case, Uh, God said, you know what, man, I'm going to show you something, and this something is going to astonish you. Imagine how thirsty Habakkuk is for God to speak to him, let alone speak to him with something that would astonish him. So as God is speaking, it says here in the first reply that God gives Habakkuk in his first complaint, and yes, this is only his first complaint, okay? Verse 5, it says, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. Can you imagine how Habakkuk is feeling in this moment to say, God, I'm crying out to you about violence, about sin, about strife, about your law being just broken by the people. Will you please do something? Will you please intercede? Will you please rescue your chosen people? And God says, I hear you, Habakkuk, and I want to tell you, I'm doing something that you can wonder at, that you are going to be astonished at, and it is so astonishing that you wouldn't even believe how good it is. I can just see Habakkuk like pressing into the Father's arms saying, yes, this is what I've been calling for, this is what I've been yelling for, this is what I've been tearing up over and sweating over and just wrestling with from the beginning here, I'm so excited to hear about this. What a picture of the sovereignty of God, that God is so in control that while Habakkuk was complaining, he was already at work on his plan of redemption for the nation of Judah. What a picture of his sovereignty. For us, sometimes, when things seem to be out of our understanding, It's essential that we remember what Isaiah prophesied from God. Isaiah 55, if you want to write it down. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, for the heavens are higher than the earth. So my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The sovereignty of God demands our trust in God, and it fuels our trust in God. In Isaiah, God says to the people, the things that I am doing are so far above what you could even think or imagine. Just sit back, relax, and trust me. The things that you're asking for, I have something so much greater. The sovereignty of God is reason to trust God, and it fuels our trust in God. Now before we get this hype train going too far, let's make sure we see exactly why Habakkuk would be astonished to the point of unbelief with what God is doing. Let's keep reading here in verse 6. God says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who marched through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Habakkuk has been crying out to God for him to rescue the people of Judah into a freedom from the sin that they are in. And God says, I've got it. I'm going to astonish you with this plan that I have. What was the plan? He's going to rise up a bitter and hasty nation, the Babylonian Empire, specifically the Chaldeans, to come in and wipe out the people of Judah. Can you imagine 
Habakkuk's like expecting, eager smile as he is just pressing into God saying, yes, this is what I've wanted to hear from you. And as God tells him the story, you can see his eager smile begin to fade into just a blank stare of inquisitiveness when God says, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring in a barbaric, hasty, and bitter people to wipe out the chosen, covenant-breaking, sinful nation of Judah. I guarantee, it's not in Scripture, I guarantee in that moment Habakkuk was running through every moment that he had ever complained to God about him not doing anything and saying, if I could just go back and take it all back, I would try something different because all of this has led to God saying, I'm going to astonish you because I'm going to ruin these people with a sinful nation. I'm sure that for Habakkuk that was a, a little bit frustrating. But it's key to note here that God did not owe Habakkuk an explanation. He didn't owe the nation of Israel an explanation. And today, he doesn't owe us an explanation because he is the king that sits on the throne in which we go to for sustenance and for nutrition and to bring our worry to. So he has no reason to give us explanation. But there's a comma after that that says, but he is gracious and he loves his people. And whether he answers or gives us a revelation or gives us a reason for his plan, he doesn't owe it to us, but he lovingly gives it to us. He takes the time to use this teachable moment to reveal a portion of his plan to Habakkuk solely because of how gracious he is. And honestly, Habakkuk learns very quickly that God is not indifferent about sin. He is not indifferent about injustice. He was not, as he said in the first verses, idly looking at wrong. While Habakkuk thought, I'm in the middle of a nation that is corrupted and being tossed around in sin, while you idly look the other direction. If he was looking the other direction, it's because he was watching the, the Babylonian Empire take down the, the Assyrian Empire and said, yep, after this they're coming to Judah. He wasn't idly looking. He was looking down the road at the plan that he had already set up. I can see Habakkuk's just face in confusion. Truth be told, this response brings more questions for Habakkuk than answered. But that's next week, so make sure you're here for that. The Babylonians have already been referred to as bitter and a hasty nation who trample empires and take whatever it is that they want. They just made waste of the Assyrian Empire, and now they have moved into Judah, and they're going to start taking out the, king, the Judean kingdom. And on top of being bitter and hasty, they are also called dreadful and fearsome. These people were not people to be messed with, but these were the people that God was using to bring forth his plan and to be a tool of discipline for a covenant-breaking people of Judah. Listen to some of the descriptive words that we hear that God paints this astounding picture that, I, that, uh, that Habakkuk is seeing. He says, they are dreadful and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Verse 8, this is frightening. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than evening wolves, and their horse pr uh, press proudly on them. I'm going to shoot straight with you. I'm afraid of horses, all right? If horses had a posable thumb, they would be the most threatening animal on the planet. And if them and the birds connected up with one another, we'd be done for. If a horse could use a rifle and a bird could drop a grenade, we'd be out. Like, our, our, we would cease to exist. So to read that their horses were swifter than leopards? No. I do not want a car-sized animal moving at the speed of a leopard. It says more fierce than evening wolves. They are more fierce than wolves that need a snack and are hungry. No thank you. Hard pass. 
and the horsemen that ride on them press on proudly. They are just as swift and fierce. He keeps saying, they come for violence. All their faces forward, they gather captives like sand. They come for destruction and violence, but they stay for the spoils. The dessert is just the people that are running around in fear that it says they gather up like sand in their hand. It says they, at kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, fortress for they pile up on earth and take it. They, are, they sweep, they, oh, they sweep, be, sorry. Then they sweep like the wind and go on guilty men whose might is their God. He says that this, this empire rushes in like a sweeping wind, like a plague of justice, and takes out everything. Kings, they scoff at them. Rulers, ha ha, funny try. And as they're taking over fortresses, they just laugh at them because they are piling them up and just living like kings among these people. They had no need for big G God. And they had no need for little g gods. Because it says here, it says here that might is their God. Power is the God in which they worship. These are describing words that God speaks about this nation. That's why he says, this will astonish you. You will be astonished because I'm going to use people who have no need for me. That power and authority is their God. These are the things that God says to him about them. This is why he calls Habakkuk to look and wonder. He taught Habakkuk through this that he will not tolerate wrong. I love the nation of Judah, but I will not tolerate wrong. And I will use these people as a tool of discipline. And I will not let sin go unpunished. And you can trust me on that one, Habakkuk. He taught Habakkuk while he was worrying here on the field, God was working behind the scenes on a big picture. Surrendering worry over to God's working requires that we trust his sovereignty. Entrusting our worry over to God's working requires us to trust his sovereignty. And when we say the word sovereignty, what that is is that God is in control of all things. He works in all things. He can work through all things. And he works all things out for the good of his own glory, which overflows onto people who bring God glory. He is sovereignly in control of all things. And sometimes in that, the answer that he presents to our worry is not the answer that we want to hear, but it is always the answer that we need to see and hear in order to press us into him and trust his sovereignty more and more. Now, I don't know where this text and this message hits you personally this morning. Obviously, with only three chapters in the book and we've only spent time in the first 11 verses. We're not going to get the full picture of Habakkuk this morning. And, and that's not the goal. Uh, the goal this morning was for us to look at the sovereignty of God and be able to trust him. The entire book of Habakkuk is about the sovereignty of God and the trust that we can have in that. I can assure you that Habakkuk, the worrying prophet gets the full picture of God's sovereignty, which leads him to a deep trust in God. And we will definitely see that over the next couple of weeks. So today I have just two points, and we're, and we're going to close here. I've got two points for us to take what we're talking about here this morning and begin to apply it in our day-to-day -day lives. The first point is that I can entrust my worry to God. If you were here a few weeks back uh, during our series in Colossians, we talked about worry and anxiety. And we went to Matthew chapter 6 during the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6 verse 25, starting there. 
Jesus preaches, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on it. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. Neither they sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his lifespan? And he summarizes it in verse 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Don't worry about the things that are stressing you in your life. Spend that energy that you would be worrying about things that are outside of your control and invest it in the trust that we can put in the sovereignty of God. If Habakkuk entrusted his worry to God because he was sovereignly at work and we serve the same God as Habakkuk, So we can entrust our worry to him. Second point this morning is that we can trust that God is at work. It's one thing for us to say that God works in our worry, but it's another thing to trust in the working that he does while we worry. Solomon uh, wrote an entire uh, wisdom literature collection for his son, Uh, in the book of Proverbs. You've heard this verse before. It's Proverbs 3, starting in verse 6 or 5. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be a healing to your flesh and a refreshment to your bones. If you are here this morning, the Bible says if you are looking for, For healing of your flesh, then trust the Lord. Give him your worry. If you are looking for refreshment to your bones, trust in the Lord and give him your worry. Do not lean on your own understanding. Give it over to him and he will refresh your flesh and he will give your bones rest. Habakkuk was reminded by God that he is trustworthy because of his sovereignty. He is at work and he is working on something astounding. No matter how bleak or difficult or difficult or tough it is to understand, I can promise you that whatever it is that you are going through right in this very moment, that God is working on something, that he will later say, wonder at this, look at this, and be astonished by it because he is in total control. He is at work in times of our worries. So this morning... If there's something that is stirring up inside of you that is causing you to worry, it's time to entrust that over to God and trust that he is working in your worries. That sounds really easy, and I understand that that's very hard. I do. I know that. Um, And what I would suggest is just take the steps of asking God, please help me trade this worry for trust. No one's asking you to be perfect in doing this. The goal is progressing in our relationship with Christ. During this next song, we're going to take uh, some moments just to reflect on the service. Um, If I could get a handful of our care team members. We're going to have care team members just kind of off to the sides here. Uh, If you need somebody to talk to about what you're worrying about, they will pray with you. They will spend time with you. Uh, And as always, the altar is open this morning if you would like to spend time praying and talking with him. I said earlier that becoming a Christian doesn't solve all of our problems. It's not the purpose of becoming a follower of Christ. It doesn't answer all of our problems, but I can tell you that it does answer the problem of sin and death in our life and gives us a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you do not have that relationship and you do not know what that looks like, I'm going to be standing up here. I'm going to be in the front row. If you need somebody to talk to about this, come and talk to me because we want to make sure you understand what it means to entrust your life to Christ so that you can bring God your worry in his time of working. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you hear us when we cry, that you are gracious to share with us your plan in your timing. We pray that you would give us patience in understanding your timing versus our expectation. I thank you so much, God, that in the times of confusion in our life, you are in control 
So this morning, we worship you in your sovereignty. We entrust our worry to you in your, in your working. And so, Father, we pray this morning, if there's anybody that is struggling, we pray that they would dump that worry out on you this morning and that you would trade them trust and confidence in who you are as our God. And if there is anybody in this room this morning that does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, may today be the day. Father, we love you very much, and we bring this to you, and we pray in your name. Amen.